Okay, Cynthia, if you want to get us started with the introductions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thank you all for joining us today for the first um, data soup. Uh, this is co-hosted by um, the Journal of eScience Librarianship and the Data Curation Network. We are very excited to have you with us today. Um, it's going to take us just a little bit of a second to bring over some of the panelists to present. So please bear with us as we kind of navigate this, this informal thing. Um, so to, today, uh, um, you'll hear from three, uh, <laughs> hey, Michaela, from um, three different groups uh, who uh, presented their work in a recent special issue of the Journal of eScience Librarianship. Uh, we'll be hearing from um, some folks who published on creating guidance for the Canadian um, Dataverse Curators, Portages Network's Dataverse Curation Guide, um, Active Curation of Large Longitudinal Surveys, and then Data Curation Through Catalogs. Um, before we hop in over to that, though, um, we're going to get a little bit more detail about JESLIP um, from Sally Gore. And um, we'll hear about the Data Curation Network from Michaela Norlock. And I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. And if at any point somebody wants me to advance them, please just speak up. Hey, I'm typing something. <laughs> okay. A couple of things in the chat. So um, that just went big screen and I can't see my notes. So welcome everyone. Uh, a brief background about um, the Journal of eScience Librarianship or JESLIB. Um, JESLIB is an open access peer reviewed journal that was founded in 2012. So we're about to have a big birthday here. We're gonna be 10 years old come February, which is really exciting. And we were founded to advance the theory and practice of data related services and librarianships across multiple uh, disciplines. We publish several types of articles, a full length journal article or full length research research articles, case studies, commentaries, and editorials. And we use multiple formats for this, both um, video, audio, and in um, digital print, of course. Um, and we've been the host for the annual special issue devoted to the content for RDEPS meeting uh, for the past four years. And we look forward to that collaboration continuing on. So leadership of the um, Data Curation Network came to us earlier this year to talk about the possibilities of a special issue, highlighting um, some of the work that comes through the, um, the work of this network and your members there. And we talked about maybe a special issue. And uh, I posted a link to that. It came to be, of course, it was a really exciting issue. And we had a lot of great contributions to it. And it eventually brought for this new little venue here, the Data Soup, where we're gonna hear from some of those authors of the papers. Um, additionally, the special issue got us to thinking about the possibility of an ongoing column devoted to uh, specifically to data curation that would be published in the regular issues of JESLib. This is really an excellent opportunity to share tools, um, processes, techniques, and things that could really benefit um, this particular group within our larger community. But we're gonna need some help to make this happen. So I'm putting out a call now, if you're interested in either writing a brief column or more helping the coordination with all of this along with me, um, please reach out. I put my email in the chat and love to hear from you. Uh, any questions that you might have about it? Is it a heavy lift? No. Is it, <laughs> uh, is it a great opportunity? Yes. All those sorts of things. So uh, feel free to reach out with that. Also, I have one last ask for the journal. We need reviewers. We need uh, peer reviewers uh, in our group. The community of librarians working in data sciences and data services has really grown over the past few years, but we find ourselves still kind of relying on the same relatively small group of people to do a lot of the um, work and related to peer review. So I'm putting that out there. We have a bunch of people on uh, the webinar today. Thanks for joining. And if you um, have some interest in giving back to the profession in this way and being a peer reviewer, really uh, would appreciate that. You can either, again, reach out to me via my email or um, you can go to the web to the journal website itself and contact us uh, that way. But we would um, really appreciate growing that body, making it more diverse, making it expanded, and, and everybody helping everybody out. 
So I, um, and if you have questions, you've never been a peer reviewer and you think, oh, I might want to do this, we're happy to help on a first, your, you know, your first go through that. And also we are um, looking to plan a training around reviewing how to do that. We've heard that from uh, several folks in our community. And so we look to do that in early 2022. So stay tuned for, for that. I think that's it for me. On behalf of Regina Raboyne, who's our editor-in-chief, Julie Goldman, our managing editor, and Lisa Palmer, our distribution editor, I want to thank the panelists today for uh, your contributions to this special issue and uh, the DCN Executive Committee for bringing it all together. And I look forward to the talks. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Michaela? Yes, if you can advance the slide, because that picture of a soup actually makes me super hungry. Um, so I'm just going to talk really quickly about the data curation network. So I only have five minutes, and I'm going to pack a lot in. So I just put our website link in the chat so you can follow up. So next slide, please, Cynthia. So the data curation network is a partnership of 14 institutions that share curatorial staff and expertise to build and maintain a trusted and community-led network of curators to advance open research by making data more ethical, reusable, and understandable. We are an active community of data stewards and curation practitioners who share knowledge and time to collaboratively curate data and advance data curation as a profession. The DCN has been active since 2016, and we officially launched as a member-funded organization in July 2021, but the initial phases were very generously funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Next slide. So some of the things, this is some of the things that the DCN um, provides and facilitates. And I'm gonna start at the very top with curation. So as I mentioned, we have 14 partner institutions and from them, we have 50 individual curation experts who are the foundation of our cross institutional curation network. Um, and what this means is we can enable curation at scale. So next slide. Institutional and data repositories are seeing increasing deposits, as we know from a wide variety of disciplines in various formats that keep changing, especially proprietary ones. And, and through the DCN, institutional members can connect with the DCN expert to curate those different data sets or formats that they might not have expertise in. Or they can work with those same experts to learn how to curate them for future reference. So in other words, the DCN community is really, really wonderful for both addressing immediate issues, like how do I curate this data and get it back to the researcher so they can get their publication in, um, but as well as for teaching and empowering local curators, here's how you can do this on your own in the future so we can constantly upskill and grow as a profession. Next slide. So in practice, um, this is what this shared curation workflow looks like. On the left-hand side, we have the DCN partner institution who receives the data from the researcher. The local curation team triages the data set to decide whether they would like to curate it locally, which is of course still an option, um, or if they want additional support from a DCN expert. When it's sent to the DCN, the coordinator, that's me, matches the data set with the pool of available curators. This depends on discipline and format considerations, as well as time, who has the capacity to work on this right now. Once a curator is selected, they then apply the curated model, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And they provide feedback and recommendations back to the DCN representative at the local institution who closes the loop with the researcher on their end. On the next slide, I have it um, laid out slightly differently so that you could um, see it in a different way if this is just how your brain works like mine. Uh, I wanna highlight that researchers still deposit like normal into their repositories. The repository staff will appraise the content and ingest it as appropriate. The local institutions maintain full responsibility for all technical functionality and authority for local decision making. But DCN seamlessly integrates into all repository systems because we're like this microservice layer that just fits on top of what's already happening. Um, so I got a couple more slides. So if we go to the next one, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about education. So those are the points two and three. Um, the DCN offers professional development opportunities and training on our curated workflow, as well as access to primers, um, which are data curation best practices that walk users through how to curate different formats for disciplines. So in the next slide, I have the, the curated steps. And I don't have time to talk through this today, but I did wanna um, show these. Um, this is really to the, a 
teaching and demonstration tool to help data curators and researchers and students understand the various steps that go into the curation process. So even though it looks very simple and linear here, we all know that curation has a lot before, a lot after, and even the letters can get mixed up as you bounce between them from time to time. On the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about our data curation primers, which are concise and iterative resources that walk users through curation and practice. So these are openly accessible to anybody. Um, they're on GitHub. They were created um, out of some training workshops that were funded by IMLS. And so members of the Data Curation Network Education subgroup helped with that effort. So thank you to them. And so we have 27 um, in total and I'm running low on time. So I'm gonna go to the last slide um, and just say that we have a really active community and which I think is demonstrated by numerous interest groups that informally research topics like big data or human subjects or racial justice in data. And they help collaboratively advance both like our network as well as data stewardship writ large. And so that is all I have. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out or visit us on our website. Oops, excellent. So next up, we have the team from um, Portage talking about creating guidance for Canadian Dataverse curators. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> the Canadians are coming. Um, hi, I'm Michael Stilworthy. I'm the co-chair of the Dataverse Creation Guide Working Group. Um, thanks for bringing us into this session. Uh, we really appreciate it. We're going to be giving this very, very quick presentation. Or I'm giving this quick presentation on behalf of all of our members. Many of them are on this call today, and they're going to be watching the chat as well. Um, and some of them you know already. What we're going to do today is talk about our Dataverse Creation Guide in four steps. The, the need for a curation guide, uh, how we looked at and adapted the DCN curated model, and how our curation model works in practice, challenges to producing training materials and documentation for a bilingual nation. There's a lot more at play here than just translation. And in our next steps, where we're going to be going next. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to start. Um, there we go. Thank you. I'm going to start with a very, very quick note here on some names and terms. Our curation guide is sponsored by the Digital Research Alliance of Canada and its RDM team, the Alliance or the Alliance. Uh, the RDM team in the Alliance has seen rapid and expected growth and evolution in the past few years. What was once the Portage Network joined up with like-minded organizations to become this thing called Endrio for a time, which itself has now turned into the Alliance. For our purposes today, know that Alliance RDM and Portage are essentially the same thing, a digital research and RDM organization within Canada to advance the interests of RDM, build capacity in training infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. All right, next slide, please. I'm gonna talk now about the need for a curation guide. As many of us are aware, there has been a growth in the importance of research data and research data curation in the past 10 years, past 20 years, really. Um, but despite that growth, training material and documentation has not kept up. Now, in Canada, we really recognize that there was this gap in curation best practices and documentation, and this became more and more evident as more and more universities either spun up or signed on to an instance of the Dataverse repository. In fact, most Canadian universities today have access to a Dataverse repository with a local data curation manager, data curator, data steward. They'll use, they'll pick and choose their own term, but they do have access to this. Uh, all on the Dataverse platform. Now, we recognize that there was this need to deliver and develop curation guidance to seasoned and new curators across the entire nation. Such documentation should be tailored to Dataverse if possible, be adaptable to a wide range of service models and sizes, uh, encourage consistency of practice, and of course, be bilingual. Next slide, please. Now, after significant research, our working group determined that the best path forward to develop this sort of material would be to adapt the DCN's curated model to fit within our, our own ecosystem. The curated framework is a proven methodology. It's adaptable. It's stewarded by like-minded individuals, many of whom are on this call. Um, and if anything, one of the, the division between 
um, we have a similar spirit, we feel, as what we see within the DCN. Um, the division of anything is a line on a map. It's one of those things where many times Canadians are looking down and like, you guys are like us, and you guys are looking up to the Canadians, and you guys are like us. And it's kind of the same way with what we saw with the curated framework. Next slide, please. Excuse me. So this slide here, this shows the basic structure of our model, the curation model. Uh, and this is probably the, you know, if there was one slide I had to show anyone, this would be it right here. You can see that we've switched from the word curated to the word curation. There's very significant reasons for this. The word curated does not operate in both English and French, which is an imperative within the Canadian context. A significant part of our population, of course, speaks French as a first language. Uh, our way forward was to adjust the acronym curated to curation. Now, some of the adjustments of this are simple, such as switching D document to N note down. In other cases, we had to organize and prioritize a, a, a new mnemonic, curation, that includes other letters like I and O, which is where evaluate for fairness and curated would turn into optimize for fairness. And in the case of I, we now have to include this actual include step where you can see we, we, we say include persistent IDs in, in, a re, in a reuse license or an agreement. Uh, the adaptions that we've made uh, mean that we in Canada have one guide that reads the same for our English, French, and bilingual communities, while staying true, we feel, to the spirit of the original model, which is very, very important to us. Next slide, please. This here is a, a quick uh, summary on how the guide works. We acknowledge there are different service models, service scenarios. Uh, you may be at a fully mediated service or semi-mediated service, and these uh, this is dependent on the size of your school capacity, your strategic priorities, all that has an effect on the amount and the kind of curation that you may actually perform. Um, and which you can see down here on this, the, the bottom part of the slide, our guide identifies different steps, operations, procedures, et cetera, et cetera, categorizes them into uh, these levels. And what is the minimum level of work you need to do to make something findable or to enhance its usability or to begin moving towards reproducibility? What this means is that we are encouraging consistency in our practices across the nation per your level of curation at your school. And, and of course, it's going to be adaptable to the local situation. But the idea is we're starting with a with a, a consistent framework. And most of the time, we're hoping that people are going to stick within that, acknowledging, of course, that there are going to be differences along the way. But we are going to be ideally seeing these levels of curation kind of work. Next slide, please. And I'm keeping an eye on the time, I promise. This slide here is just a simple screenshot, shows one of the pages of our document. I think this is actually from the GSLIB article. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, for many people who have seen the curated um, model, it does look familiar in some respects. When you crack it open, you'll begin to see where the levels begin to play vis-a-vis uh, -vis the steps, um, check, understand, so on and so forth. Uh, and you'd also find that there are different reference guides where we kind of make this uh, very printable into one or two page documents to uh, to, to adapt and use at your local institution. Next slide, please. Some notes on this slide here, which will show the fact that, as I was talking before, your creation service and your levels of creation, um, they, are local in, they are local things. Uh, what we are proposing and what we recommend, they aren't going to map perfectly. And we know that, we acknowledge that, but we are promoting practices that can be adapted locally uh, per these uh, situations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the slide here is uh, language challenges. We made, we intentionally made this decision to keep the French in the slides to remind people of the language challenges that we do face. Uh, we want you to know that there are challenges to developing a guide in two languages outside of translating that acronym, which is the backbone. Uh, sometimes um, an ideal taxonomy in one language doesn't work in the other language. Sometimes licenses are found only in English and not in French. There's a large corpus of resources in English for curation, but often not found in French. And so there's also this question of working with precise technical vocabularies in one language that don't uh, that, that then need to be matched to a precise technical vocabulary in French as well. This means additional time and cost for translation services and additional labor for our bilingual colleagues who worked on this with us. Our next slide, please, which I think is going to be our second to last slide, we're into next steps. What we want to do now is adapt the guide. Uh, now that it's released, we're, we're going to keep working on it, uh, adapt it as required based on usage and feedback. We do know we need more French exemplars and resources. We need more templates for correspondence. Um, workshops, 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 workshops. We plan on really pushing this. Uh, most important, we want to take this document and turn it into a web-based resource to make it easier to navigate 
easier to adapt, easier to update, easier to contribute new content. Next slide, please. Which finishes off with uh, uh, all the names of all the people who have worked on this slide. You hopefully will know some of these people on the call today uh, and contact information down at the bottom. And I believe that's it. And we're happy to take questions when we are through. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so up next, we have active curation of large longitudinal surveys. Ina, are you with us? Yeah, I am. Great. Thank Hello. you. Hello. All right. Um, hi, everyone. So switching gears a little bit here and uh, talking about mostly what happens before the files are submitted uh, to a data curator. Survey data is a known entity in the world of data curation. However, most of the actions, like I said, happen sort of after the data is collected and analyzed. And in this study, we argue that curation also happens during data collection, especially when the survey is large and longitudinal. Our team is involved in such a large longitudinal survey project, and we use it as a case study that allowed us to look closer at what we call active curation. Um, as you might know, Creating quality survey data is very labor intensive and curation actions often combine technical, social, cultural, organizational aspects. We wanted to examine those aspects and systematically describe them. Our goal was to better understand what is involved in moving the data from its creation to the state that is needed to conduct scientific analysis. Next slide, please. Um, so active curation, uh, to emphasize that we are looking at data work at the early stages of the data life cycle, we use this notion of active curation. Uh, this term refers to establishing good processes and capturing data and metadata early and close to the source of data. Data objects at the early stages are live, they're fluid, and they change frequently. So the curation processes need to be flexible and support frequent changes and review. Active curation also needs to support team coordination because at the early stages, many people may be involved in the data work. Finally, um, the term active also implies continuity and connection to the subsequent stages of the project, mainly data sharing and preservation. And in our work, we want to encourage collaborations between libraries and other academic units in building services that support data across both earlier or live uh, versions and more final published or archived states of data. Next slide. So our case study is based on this survey uh, that is called the person-to-person -person health interview study or P2P for short. And it's part of the Indiana University Precision Health Initiative. Uh, the survey collects a lot of information. Uh, so it focuses on collecting information about diseases uh, and uh, it's a random representative sample of about 200 uh, residents uh, of Indiana State in the US. Uh, it's very complex. So there are hundreds of questions in this survey. It also collects biometric information, such as height, weight, blood pressure. It also collects saliva samples uh, to do some subsequent DNA analysis. And in addition to that, there's a mental health component uh, that is administered through a separate third party uh, survey questionnaire. So the team is also pretty large and complex. It includes the science team, the researchers who uh, will be working with uh, the collected data, but also a team of data managers. And this is what I call data team. This is the co-authors of this paper. Next slide, please. To ensure the success of such a complex survey, our data team developed an infrastructure to support all the tasks related to survey data collection and processing. And these active curation activities can be broken down into four larger categories, development, collection, management, and delivery and analytics. So development includes um, developing questionnaires in the form that will be used for survey administration, basically programming the survey, and then recruiting and training office and field staff, informing the community of the upcoming survey, sampling and design of the whole IT infrastructure that supports the rest of the components. Collection of data includes contacting, recruiting and selecting participants, administering the survey, establishing field operations and organizing logging to make sure that all survey assets are tracked and reviewed. 
management includes all the activities and that focuses on data management of course uh, includes all the activities of reviewing and transferring data from its original sources which include tablets and third-party platforms into a unified database platform and then editing cleaning validating and recoding the data finally delivery and analytics includes the identification preparation of a code book also producing some initial insights and descriptive statistics and delivery of all of that to the science team. This is the final stage performed by our data team, but curation, of course, does not end here. Next slide. As we examine these stages and its, its processes in our case study, uh, we realized that each of them has multiple curation objects that need attention. Thus, at the development stage, we'll work with a sample received from another organization and load it into the case management system. Then we'll program the survey instrument and make sure it includes all the necessary components and logic. We collected pilot data and made sure that all software components work together. And also, as we go, we make adjustments um, along the way. The documentation of this and other stages becomes part of the data curation record as well. And you can see at each of the stages, all these multiple curation objects on the slide. Um, and uh, as you can see, it involves not only some forms of data that are part of the curation, but also a lot of processes, tools, and workflows and various intermediary outcomes. One of the main achievements, I think, of our team is the development of an integrated database that simplifies tracking of all these assets and integration between several tools and software. We developed automated workflows to transfer data from server to server and from vendor to vendor. And this allows us to maintain integrity and quality of the data and also quickly adapt to changes uh, that happen along the way. What is missing from this diagram is the stage of sharing and preservation. And this is the disconnect between active curation and what can be called traditional curation that we'd like to highlight and bring into the discussion. Our work ends with the delivery of data for ongoing analysis. The Survey Research Center, uh, where we work, has its own policies of storage and retention of research data, but these policies are not coordinated with other units on campus involved in data work. So transferring data to an institutional or other repository is a completely separate task. And currently it is solely the responsibility of the researcher, uh, which I think is pretty hard and it's pretty big responsibility. And we think it's important to develop processes for connecting active and archival data products, but uh, that needs guidance and more workflows that support this transition from active to the final stages of research products. Next slide. So finally, uh, I'd like to conclude with some recommendations that we came up with in our case study. Uh, we believe these recommendations can help to build better support for active curation, as well as encourage collaborations between various units on campus. Um, number one is to develop a consistent approach to working with active or live data. And that includes training the personnel, uh, integrating all the assets, focusing on time management, and also creating tools that can be reused. Um, the second one is designing curation for current and future data work. And I think it's important, especially for uh, units such as ours uh, and for libraries as well, because that means uh, the alignment of sort of this planning for curation with larger unit goals and uh, understanding that there are original and derived products that also need support. The third one is considering working uh, with humans as part of curation. And that, that includes not only understanding that there's, a, that, that, that there's a need for a dedicated team, but also understanding that sample curation is important. And by sample, I mean respondents. So people who contribute the data or re respond to our surveys, uh, it's important to maintain a relationship with them. And we have uh, this whole process of um, uh, maintaining a database of the contacts and, and uh, including them in the future studies. Uh, and finally, uh, develop and adopt standards for active curation. As data generating organizations, they, we need to be a part of the curation ecosystem. And uh, like I said before, the stages of active curation or early stages of the data life cycle need to be aligned with later stages and having standards uh, to do that will will help to improve this whole curation ecosystem. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, last up, before we kind of get to the Q&A, um, we have data curation through catalogs and we have uh, Helen Mary Sheridan. Everyone, uh, thanks for being here today. Thanks for the invitation. We also have a couple of the co-authors here. So uh, Anthony is here to talk about what his institution has been doing. And I don't know if Sarah was able to join us, but if she is, she's going to be able to chime in here too. Uh, right, so let's get to it. Uh, can you next slide please thank you okay so um, our paper our study is about uh, data curation through catalogs so what is a catalog in this case uh, defined broadly we're talking about catalogs as a curated set of metadata records the point and describe to uh, data objects of interest so in this case you know you can think of a data catalog very similar to a library catalog where it tells you what the resource is um, authority controlled and authoritative metadata about that and then it actually tells you where you can go and access that and maybe if it's a resource let's say it's a book that's in off-site storage right it might provide a mechanism for you to request access to that material so in the same way a data catalog describes and points to these digital objects but if it's something that's not immediately available it can provide access instructions so that you can apply for access to that material contact a researcher or any other mechanism if it's not immediately available um, in this model, it's important to know what isn't a data catalog. So maybe the most obvious example here is the Google dataset search that rolled out a few years ago now, um, where it's, uh, it harvests metadata from many repositories, other data indices, et cetera. And so by entering, you know, simple search terms in Google dataset search, you can get returned metadata and access instructions there, but those resources, those metadata records are not curated on Google's side. It is only taking what it scraped from the web. And so that display, though it may be harvesting from catalogs, is not in itself a catalog. Um, there is a quick question, and because this is so immediately avail uh, important, I'll answer it now. Uh, what do you mean by catalog? Do you mean an ILS? No, we don't, um, although these can be integrated in catalogs. So in our examples here, um, a data catalog would be a standalone web application. Um, it would be something that in our instances, you know, so I'm at the University of Pittsburgh Health Sciences Library System. Uh, we run a PHP based software application uh, with code that was developed from the NYU uh, Medical Library, but Sarah Manheimer at Montana State University, she has um, a whole different system that they built. You know, there, there are various people who are running different forms of catalogs with underlying platforms that may differ. And in this, in this work, we discuss, you know, the reasons why you might want to do this and what the contribution is to data curation through a catalog. So some of the initial reasons um, that came up in our discussion, you know, for the University of Pittsburgh, just using this as a, um, as a model here, Repositories, institutional repositories, especially for data in particular, they can be really expensive. You know, it takes time, it takes expertise. You have to factor in storage costs. If you partner with, you know, an outside uh, provider, you know, you get a Figshare instance, something like that. That's also time and storage costs and, you know, just negotiating those contract, uh, contracts. So figuring out a catalog may be more sustainable in the long run. It may be a more appropriate fit for an institution's scope. So catalogs can describe and point to data that wouldn't be included in a repository otherwise. Um, in the examples that are, you know, within our research group and studied within this paper, there are a, num a number of catalogs that focus on access to sensitive data. So something where, you know, your institutional repository, some are perfectly capable of handling, you know, sensitive data and some are not. Uh, some, whether or not they are capable of handling this, researchers might not feel comfortable putting their data into a repository, right? There, there's a certain element of, of researcher hesitancy, which we, because a lot of the people who are starting out here uh, are in the health sciences, you know, there's a, an amount of clinical data, personally identifying health information, et cetera, where there is some resistance to total repository adoption. Um, and then general access protocols. So, you know, maybe it's not super sensitive, but you still want to keep track of who is accessing this data. 
Um, what are their reasons for using it? Maybe it's something where you want to go through a red cap form and uh, you know, connect it to an EHR system for accessing clinical data. Uh, there are a number of ways that these can be integrated into a catalog that isn't necessarily fully within the scope of a traditional repository. And that comes to the next point too, so security. So uh, while Cornell, uh, Cornell Medicine is one example institution uh, where their catalog really specializes in data governance. They have wholly integrated their catalog, which is the public facing index of all of the available researcher generated data sets that while Cornell has put together. They have integrated it with their secure data enclave. So let's say you're a researcher, you know, at Wild Cornell and you are looking for a study that was performed by a colleague. Uh, you can look through this catalog, maybe you can search for their name, maybe you can look up for keywords, and you can find a description of that data set. But you're not able to immediately access it unless you can go through that secure data enclave, which is built right into the data catalog platform, into that interface there. So it's something that offers uh, more potential endpoints for working with maybe a CTSI system or with particular IT requirements. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, one other reason for catalogs is just better co-location. Um, so we are working you know, with a lot of researchers who put their data in all kinds of places. And maybe that is because uh, as a researcher has progressed through his or her career, he moves from one repository to another. Maybe there is some data that historically has lived on a scholar's lab website. Maybe, uh, maybe she is putting her code on GitHub and she's registering her protocols and her registrations on OSF and her data lives in Dryad. Well, you can pull all of those together, all of those pointers into one metadata record in a data catalog. Um, and then that ties into efficiency, which is basically, you know, there are a lot of great repositories already out there. And not everyone wants to reinvent that particular wheel, um, especially if you're an institution that either doesn't have a, a repository that's optimized for data or you do, but for one institutional reason or another, that's not where your researchers are putting their data. Perhaps having a data catalog makes that data more findable where it already is. So uh, there have been some discussions. I know there was one on the data cure Slack a while ago, a couple of days ago, of you know there's there's sometimes some hesitancy over whether researchers should deposit their data sets in an institutional repository or in a domain specific repository um, or a generalist repository like Zenodo or Dryad. And the idea being that you know well you can't necessarily see what researchers are putting in Figshare and God knows what the quality of the metadata is in there. So if you have a chance to validate that metadata as they submit it to your institutional repository, maybe that's a better, you know, that, that produces a better outcome. Unfortunately, it's not, a, it's not always possible to get in at that moment of intervention, right? So when you have a data catalog, you can take the material wherever it happens to live and curate that metadata, you can really increase the value of the descriptive information so that the value of the data is, is presented in its best light, no matter where it lives. Next slide, please. So you've seen this before. <laughs> this is the big wall of text um, in this presentation, but these are the DCN curated steps. And I wanted to compare this to the data catalog activities that data stewards, let's say, who are in our, our group routinely perform, because there's a lot of overlap. It's not the same thing by any means. Um, and all of this varies institution by institution, right? Because there are a thousand ways to run a data catalog. But very often, uh, the focus in a data catalog really leans hard on that augment with metadata for findability, that A step, because catalogers for a data catalog are focusing on creating descriptive metadata, admin metadata, all of this, uh, working with the focus of data discovery in the primary uh, instance. And that's in part because you know, you're not messing around with the actual files themselves. You have no obligation, but also no opportunity to, for example, you know, contact a researcher and, and insist that they use a non-proprietary file format. Um, 
individually, you know, many of us are data librarians, for example, and we can do that on our own terms. So, you know, reach out to that researcher, but it's not a part of the workflow automatically. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we are part of a working group. So the authors of this paper, we are all part of the data discovery collaboration, um, which is a network that is uh, made up of individuals and institutions that are all interested in promoting data discovery. So we are platform agnostic. We are not about data catalogs. Um, we actually grew out of a previous data catalog collaboration project, but NYU Langone, University of Pittsburgh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Northwestern's Medical Library, the University of Maryland, Montana State University, Hofstra and Weill Cornell, um, the majority of these institutions are in the health sciences, but that is not a requirement and we are you know, very open to partnership or open conversation. Next slide, please. This is just a quick overview. I mentioned that you know, we did form from the data catalog collaboration project uh, because someone was asking about the particular software. NYU developed this, this open source software system that a bunch of other organizations adopted. And so we came together as a network to pool metadata ideas, uh, help each other with the technical implementation, et cetera. But over time that developed into more of a, an interest in sharing methods and philosophy uh, of increasing access and findability for data sets in general. So now again, we are platform agnostic. Next slide, because I'm very conscious of time here. Uh, I just wanna say that we are actively, you know, having discussions and developing new areas of research. So one of the things that we're talking about in the metadata core group, because our network uh, does have, you know, working discussions, sorry, that's my own personal timer here, is how to represent basic science concepts um, and how to do that in a way that uh, both makes sense to, or things like Google dataset search and makes sense to bench science researchers. If you are looking for a very particular, you know, subtype of a study organism, how do you support things like software code? And then how do you integrate these with other resources? So maybe integration with repositories, maybe integration with biomedical registries and taxonomies. We're working on these uh, and providing guidance to organizations, no matter what the platform or implementation of a data discovery system they're working with. Next slide. And that's it. So this is uh, the co-authors and their institutions. And thank you all so much. And uh, Anthony is here to, to join in the Q&A too. Great, well, thank you to um, Helen Mary and all of our presenters. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came through on the chat. Um, I think Helen Mary and those of you who uh, had written the previous article, we have a question from Sherry Lake. Hey, Sherry. Um, is one of your requirements for what data you catalog is that you only catalog well curated data? So I think she's getting at trying to understand what um, what criteria you use to evaluate uh, what you what you include in the catalog. I would say no, and I think that's actually one of our strengths um, because so much of what we catalog is uh, otherwise hidden. So I think that you would have trouble saying that a data set is well curated if, for example, it's only available on a researcher's lab servers, right? Uh, but if we talk to them, we have a conversation, we say, you know, hey, in your own words, can you describe this data set? And we create a metadata record for that data set uh, that we consider well curated, right? That metadata is um, authority controlled and descriptive and comprehensive as we can get it and we provide contact information from the researcher and, and encourage them to make it as public as possible, then that is the added curation value. So we hope to be able to meet researchers and depositors where they are, and then bring the, the curation level of that data up from there. I, I would add that, we're, that it's also institution specific, the, the source of data records. And everything that Helen Mary has said is absolutely true. Uh, but different uh, institutions that are part of our, our groups choose different sources uh, to focus on. Uh, we actually also include some published uh, data sets that are part of publications. Uh, so one would hope that they are well curated data sets as well. Uh, but 
the real sort of gold nuggets are the ones that are more hidden uh, and we're adding significant discoverability to. I'm muted. I, that's not good. Um, so this one is more focused on the DCN. Michaela, if you're around. Um, so how does the DCN and other data repositories, I guess anyone can answer this, but um, work with journal required data deposits? And thank you, Scott, for the question. Yeah, so I can jump in um, with the caveat that I've actually only been at the DCN for three weeks now. So if somebody else has a better answer, like please chime in. Um, so my hunch is that, um, at least from DCN, we work with uh, researchers through their local institutions. So somebody at, for example, University of Michigan would go to those curation experts and say, I need this data curated for this article that's forthcoming. Can you help me with that? Um, and that's how the DCN gets involved. Usually, like then Michigan would submit it and we would help curate it for that journal. I can just also add that um, some of the DCN members actually work directly with other data repositories as well, such as Dryad, um, who have more automated mechanisms for um, working directly with journal, or excuse me, with publishers and other um, journal platforms to be, uh, it gets integrated into the editorial workflow. Um, and so in the collaboration with Dryad, they're able to curate uh, materials locally um, and, and, and are working are working that way before it's being actually deposited at, at another repository location. Um, so another question we had was from Sarah Del Norte. Norte. Um, wouldn't disclosure risk and mitigation be considered a key component of well curated data? And I think this is kind of open to everyone. Um, if anyone wants to jump in. I'll jump in, I guess. Um, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, the long answer is not, it depends, but like, I don't know, one of the things that, that that we encountered when we were developing the curation guide for users across an entire country with uh, varying levels of experiences is what kind of capacity, what kind of like knowledge set do you have and time capacity do you have to go through um, a disclosure risk review? And that's not to say that it should not happen, um, but it is to say that uh, when we talk about curation today and the tail end of 2021, I, I think we need to recognize that there are many, many people who do not know what a disclosure risk review would actually entail. And ideally, they would know enough to say, I need to pass this on to someone else, or I need to send that back to the depositor. Um, and the curation or that, that actual risk review needs to be uh, a more fulsome experience with, with the PI as well. So I'm not trying to wiggle my way through this, but it's something that, that came up for us when we were trying to, to build out a, a best practices guide for practitioners who may or may not have expertise or, or experience in this area. And the, the question is, how, how do you deal with that? Um, when you're working with general repositories as, as our guide uh, primarily is devoted to, uh, we really had to say, yeah, the short answer is you, you need to consider these things, but you may not be able to. And so you need to know what your resources are on your campus and within your, let's say your consortia or your research group or whatever to, to, to turn to when, when you do have that gap at the same time. So a very interesting subtlety to that, that question there. And from the data catalog perspective, I'll say, you know, disclosure, risk review, and mitigation, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that is something I think that we all try to do when we're talking to a researcher, um, where, you know, I'll use a recent example. I was talking to a nursing researcher. She's a PhD student, and she is working on a data set that is um, text. It's scraped data from a forum in which nurses and patients are corresponding. So it's, it's a trial that's uh, looking to see whether basically, like, talk therapy through a forum can help encourage patients to manage their symptoms better. And she has this big data set and she wants to do natural language analysis on it. 
So she wants to do text mining and sort of like topic modeling and, and extract things from this data set and make it available to other researchers. There is a ton of identifying information in this data set, right? You've got usernames, you've got nurses' names, you've got patient names, you've got, you know, my cousin Johnny came to visit and he brought his three kids, you know, Aaron, Clyde, and Rocky. You've got, you know, I'm a pediatrician in Little Rock, Arkansas. There's just a ton. But, you know, you can use various tools to, to uh, scrub that, de-identify it. But at a certain point, you strip away what is actually of interest. Um, it's one of those things with natural language processing and with text analysis, especially in the health disciplines, right, where the, the personal information to a point is actually necessary for analysis. Um, and that point will always vary, right, depending on the particular application. So in this case, she didn't feel like she could completely de-identify it because it would render it useless to other researchers. But she didn't feel comfortable like putting it on the web, you know, even, even in uh, a repository where probably, you know, no patients would come across it. Because what if they recognized themselves, you know, even though their name had been stripped and they, you know, felt some kind of way about it. And, uh, you know, she went back to talk to the IRB folks and, you know, it was all in the clear technically, but there was still this, this iffiness. So in that case, maybe, you know, keeping it by author approval only or contact the author to access this data set is the right choice, at least for now, un until there's a better solution for that. Um, so there's that review, mitigation only goes to a point, and then maybe it's still, you have a, a, an imperfect compromise. Thank you. We did have another question that was in the Q&A. Sorry, I, I missed this a few minutes ago. Um, for the, the um, data cataloger, or data cataloger, data catalog um, folks, um, I would assume that each of these catalogs are using their own localized metadata standards for the catalogs themselves. But generally, how much of the information that you ingest as your sources do you find do you find you keep as is versus ingested content that needs added curation to reach whatever standard you have set for your data catalog records. Anthony, do you want to talk about that? Because I think you do more API work. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm going to guess that everybody does quite a bit of curation work uh, for the metadata records themselves. Um, we don't really ingest records in the sense of just like a, an export and an import. It's more like a, Cat, more of a maybe more of a traditional style of cataloging item in hand. You're looking at the uh, the data, and you're looking at the the record that maybe already exists or whatever is the source um, that already exists, and then we're we're adding a lot of uh, access points to that data and uh, correcting, consolidating, uh, massaging data so that it fits within our standards. I'd say that's a it's a pretty heavy lift component. We're looking to utilize uh, APIs where possible to to lower the burden of manual cataloging. Um, we we're using that with, for example, uh, one of our our subject headings is is oncotree terms. Uh, that's a cancer specific uh, 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 subject heading, and we're utilizing some APIs to reduce keystroke errors to help with. Uh, selection of terms and to pull in additional information. So it, it still definitely requires uh, curation. I don't know, I, I'm guessing, Helen Mary, I'm guessing you, you probably have a similar experience. Yeah, we, we do a lot more manually, I would say. Um, and then on the metadata front, so of course, you know, every institution is different, but those who are using the data catalog software developed by NYU, which doesn't really have a snappy name, so I'm just going to call it the NYU data catalog software, we do have a, a shared metadata schema um, that's adapt, adapted from, I mean, it came out of BioCaddy, um, but, uh, you know, we regularly meet to hash out, you know, are we going to adopt new elements and how are they going to be represented and fold that back into the code base. So that was like the, the current discussion with subject of study. So we do share metadata um, and we do, we do have these discussions. Thank you. Um, and, and no, it was a perfectly worded, perfectly worded question, Wendy. I think I was, I was confused as I was reading it. Um, Dr. Cooper, I kind of have a question for you. I'm curious to know if you have any ideas or thoughts or strategies about how 
libraries and others who are or, or really like anybody in the kind of higher ed landscape can partner with faculty or partner across stakeholders to facilitate this curation kind of pipeline from active to shared to preservation um, and, and your thoughts about that? Um, well, not really. I think, you know, our, our paper was sort of the goal was to identify this disconnect and encourage uh, the discussion because at our institution, we do not have those discussions yet. I think, I think we are at the you know, stage where each unit kind of develops their own processes. And so, so that's why I think you know, the active and uh, yeah, the later stages are disconnected. But then I think the first step is probably to have these conversations and to have these discussions. Uh, and that's, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in continuing this conversation and, you know, talking to others and, and learning, like, are other people doing anything, you know, at their institutions? Because I know that the service centers or other uh, units that are involved in data generation, uh, they exist on campuses, right, in academia. Uh, but how do we connect them? And uh, technically and culturally, right, there, there, there are a lot of things uh, that are involved. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm no, curious about what other people have to say, but um, that's really it's an answer. A, it's a, it's like a slippery fish or whatever. Like we um we being in universities before joining ARL, it was always sort of this. Well, how do we get engaged at other points and and make it sort of um, enterprise as opposed to just sort of bespoke um, and uh, you know I think conversations and discussions are a, a fabulous first step. Um, if anybody else on the panel has ideas and strategies that they've used, it would be great to hear. Tough topic. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Just putting people on the spot. Um, <laughs> we're also out of time. Um, I, I hope some folks did bring some soup and were sitting at um, eating soup on their, um, not on their computers, because that would be messy, but nearby. Um, <laughs> please, please uh, uh, um, join me in um, thanking the presenters today in um, uh, providing information about their curation workflows and sort of their research to date. Um, I think this has been really fascinating and uh, a, a really great um, expansive view of um, some of the curation happening at, at world or in North America at least. So um, thank you all for joining us and um, look for the next session soon. Regina, did you wanna add anything? I just wanted to uh, thank Pat Renaro from um, UMass Chan's uh, ITAV support for putting this together. Um, I felt very comfortable having him uh, in the background. And thank you to everybody at JESLIB and DCN uh, for uh, doing this program. And we look forward to hosting more. So thank you, everybody, and have a good holiday.